Chapter 6 The Tombs of the New Kingdom's Valley of the Kings and Queens A. The Valley of the Kings Thebes served as the capital city for the New Kingdom's kings, who opted to bury their mummies in the hilly area that is now known as the Valley of the Kings on the western bank of the city. This region was not chosen in vain, nor was it chosen by accident. It is known that the ancient Egyptians took great care to preserve the body, mummifying it and putting it in a fortified location that was as secure as they could make it. For kings, the burial chamber was inside the pyramid, for common people, it was beneath their tombs. Following that, the king's theories about how their tombs were built changed when they saw how their contents were looted. The massive pyramid in the Old Kingdom draws attention and serves as concrete proof of the existence of a royal tomb, but it did not fulfill its intended function of shielding the king's mummy and everything inside it including valuables, relics, and Shep Derver from the manipulation of tomb robbers. Regarding the Middle Kingdom's kings, a few of them constructed pyramids that were comparatively modest, but they added complexity to the internal passageways that led to the burial chamber because it made them feel safer. Additionally, this strategy failed to stop tomb robbers from tampering with the king's mummy and the funerary equipment inside the pyramid. The kings of the 18th dynasty realized that the two earlier strategies had not stopped robbers from trying to loot from their tombs. As a result, they had to find a new strategy in the hopes that the king or queen's body would be kept safe and out of the hands of robbers in their eternal home. This is the reason the kings of this dynasty, as well as their successors in the following two dynasties, 19th and 20th, resorted to secretly cutting their tombs in a valley in western Thebes, among the rocky rocks concealed behind the plateaus, which is known as the Valley of the Kings. This valley was a desolate place at the time, devoid of vegetation, water, humans, or animals. Stated differently, it was thought to be the greatest location to conceal the tomb from robbers. The western bank of Thebes was known by a number of names given by the ancient Egyptians in the New Kingdom, including One west of the city is referred to as Imantednit. Two west of Wast, Thebes, is referred to as Imantet Wast. Three the west is referred to as Imantet. Four the western side is referred to as Terit Imantet. Five this side is referred to as Terit. Six this side of the city is referred to as Terit Imnet. In the New Kingdom, the Valley of the Kings was referred to by a number of names, including Ant, Ta'ent, and Ra Ta'ent, which meant Valley, the Valley, and the Mouth, or Entrance, of the Valley respectively, in addition to CKTAT, which meant Great Field. This might be a reference to the Netherworld's Yaru or Yaru Fields, where the owner of the tomb aspires to reside. The royal tomb in the New Kingdom was also given several names by the ancient Egyptian. Bakar means the tomb, Akaniya refers to the horizon of eternity, Setnia means the abode or place of eternity, and Setmat means the abode or place of truth. Moreover, Setat means the great abode or place, and Ta Setpare means the king's abode or place, along with the word Set meaning the abode or place. The Greeks gave the name syringes, plural of syrinx, which means the shepherd's pipes, to the tombs of the New Kingdom's kings because these tombs, particularly those of the 19th and 20th dynasties, had lengthy passageways that bore resemblance to shepherd's pipes. Strabo, the Greek geographer, wrote in the last century BC that there are 40 tombs there that are worth seeing while Diodorus of Sicily only listed 17 tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Richard Bocock, an English explorer who visited Egypt in 1737 to 1738, is credited as being the first person to write about the tombs in the Valley of the Kings in the modern era, 1734. However, Pocock only mentioned 14 tombs in his account. The Napoleon Bonaparte Expedition, 1799 to 1801, reports only 11 tombs, and Beltsoni. 1817, mentions 18 tombs. The current count of tombs found in the Valley of the Kings is at 64, including both royal and non-royal tombs. The 18th Dynasty Kings instituted a novel regulation, 
whereby the section allotted for the interment of the royal mummies was concealed in an unidentified, uninhabited location within the Valley of the Kings. The Memorial Temple, which was built in the area designated for the establishment of religious rites and rituals beneficial to the deceased, was constructed, as I mentioned, close to the cultivated lands on the western bank of Luxor. In contrast to the practices of the 20th dynasty, Ramesses VI, the kings of this dynasty chose to forego the idea of hiding the tomb entrances, particularly since it did not accomplish its intended purpose of preserving their mummies and the priceless funerary equipment within. They employed massive blocks to block the entrances to their tombs as a means of protection, and they oversaw the guards. For this reason, there is a noticeable distinction between the tombs of the 18th dynasty and the 20th dynasty kings. In contrast to the tombs of the kings of the 18th dynasty, which left their front passageways empty of any text, the kings of the 20th dynasty gave careful consideration to the entrances to their tombs and ordered them to be colored and engraved. It is also observed that the sarcophagi of the 18th dynasty kings are modest in comparison to those of the 20th dynasty kings, who are characterized by their enormous size and weight. The kings of the 18th, 19th, and 20 dynasties are buried in the tombs hewn out and dug into the mountain rock in the Valley of the King. After that, burials there stopped. It is noteworthy, nonetheless, that the majority of the 21st dynasty's mummies were discovered in a large cache in Deir el-Bahari in 1881, suggesting that their final resting place may have been in or close to western Thebes. The first king of the New Kingdom, Thutmose I, carved out his royal tomb in the Valley of the Kings. It was a desolate place at the time, devoid of any vegetation or water, and uninhabited by either people or animals. For this reason, he picked it and gave the order to have his tomb cut into the mountain's rock. Based on the wording engraved on the stela of the engineer Inani, which is reserved in his tomb, number 81, in the Sheikh el Kurna neighborhood on the western side of Thebes, it appears that he first kept the details of carving this tomb extremely secret. I oversaw the excavation of His Majesty's rock tomb alone, no one saw or heard, the text reads. It is hard, nevertheless, to trust what Inani said, since funeral rites were clearly attended by a number of prominent persons in addition to the tomb's knowledge, if limited to laborers and artists. All of the theories that claim the king was using prisoners of wars and that the work was done at night so that the tomb's location would remain hidden are erroneous. For the sake of argument, let us assume that the king was directing the killing of any foreign laborers who were employed there, if so, what would he have done with the expert artisans of ancient Egyptians? Although it is often believed that the 18th dynasty's strong authority implied protection for the king's tombs, Hatshepsut's removal of her father Thutmose's mummy from his tomb and hiding him in her own tomb reputes this hypothesis. It also turns out that the tomb of Tutankhamun was opened in antiquity. There are remnants of two successive openings that were mortared over again. With seals on its entrance, this was verified. When the robbers started to loot it, it seemed that they were taken aback. The text, which dates back to Horemheb's reign, is written in hieratic script on the southern wall of the hall that precedes the burial chamber in Tuthmosis IV's tomb confirms that King Oremheb gave orders to rebury the King Tuthmosis IV in the sacred residence on the western mainland to the supervisor of the cemetery works, Maya and his assistant Jehudi Mess. This led to the moving of Tuthmosis IV's mummy and other mummies to the tomb of Amenahab II. All of data suggests that the king's tombs were not protected from tomb robbers even during the 18th dynasty's stronghold. The final years of Ramesses III's reign saw a clear manifestation of the principles of weak royal authority, collapsing economic conditions, and growing power for the priests of Amun. Things got worse, and the kings of the 21st dynasty found themselves unable to protect the mummies of their ancestors, which were vulnerable to looting. As a result, they believed they should gather these royal mummies and bury them in multiple caches in order to preserve them. Emil Brugge, Maspero's assistant at the time, discovered the famous mummies cache in Deir el-Bahari in July 1881. Inside the tomb number 320 at Deir el-Bahari, owned by a woman named Inhabi, 
were 40 mummies devoid of any funerary furnishings. Among the mummies discovered were those of the great Egyptian kings, including Sikinenra, Amenhotep I, Tuthmosis II, Ramesses I, Seti I, Ramesses II, Ramesses III, and others. Inside heavy wooden coffins bearing simply their owners' names and without any decoration, lay the kings. They are all currently on display at the Egyptian Museum's Mummies Hall. In 1898, Victor Lorit found King Amenhotep II's tomb after obtaining some information secretly. Out of the 13 mummies found within, only 9 belonged to the ancient Egyptian kings. We list Thutmose IV, Amenhotep III, Ramesses IV, V, and six among them, in addition to the mummy of the tomb's owner, King Amenhotep II. They are all currently on display at the Egyptian Museum's Mummies Hall. Following the completion of his excavations in the Valley of the Kings in 1817, G.B. Veltsoni declared, It is my firm opinion that in the Valley of Biban el Muluk there are no more tombs that are not known. Subsequently, a number of scholars followed in his footsteps, including Champollion and Wilkinson, the first to assign numbers to the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, Ferdinand, Rosalini, Rawlinson, Lepsius, and others. These scholars validated Belthsoni's belief that everything within the valley had been driven out and excreted. Following Lowert's discovery of Amenhotep II's tomb in 1898, which included the royal mummies, experts, and scientists were certain that the Valley of the Kings held more secrets and had tombs that had not yet been excavated. Theodore Davis, an American, was granted permission by the Antiquities Service in 1902 to conduct excavations in the valley. This work was done in collaboration with Quibell, Edward Ayrton, Arthur Veigal, and a young man named Howard Carter. In 1903, the Thugbo's Force tomb was discovered by Carter. Following the discovery of several non-royal tombs by Ayrton, Wiggle, and Davies, Davies wrote his well-known book Introduction, I Fear That the Valley of the Kings Is Now Exhumed, discussing the excavations in the Valley of the Kings. After arriving in Egypt in 1917, Lord Carnarvon was gained permission to explore artifacts in the Valley of the Kings. He picked Carter, who in 1922 was able to locate Tutankhamun's tomb. The rooms and corridors that are carved out of the mountain rock and intersected by wells are typical components of the royal tombs located in the Valley of the Kings. The tomb's walls were decorated with scenes, drawings, and a variety of religious texts, the majority of which were religious books. These included what is in the netherworld, the gates, the dead, the caverns, the earth, solar hymns, and the story of the destruction of mankind, in addition to some religious rituals such as the opening the mouth ritual. Views on the function of the well in the royal tomb vary. Some think its aim was to deceive would-be robbers, while others think it served as a location to catch any occasional rainfall so that it wouldn't enter the burial chamber. After discussing the old opinions, Friedrich Aptus came to the following conclusion in his treatise, there is a religious function for these wells. First, the tombs equipped with wells are completely finished tombs. It is very easy to place some wooden boards to cover these wells and pass over them, especially after the kings, chief engineers, and artists saw the extent to which tomb robbers were able to loot the tombs of the Middle Kingdom kings, despite their cunning tricks to prevent the robbery of the burial chamber. If they had been meant to be an obstacle, they would have prevented the workers themselves from finishing the tomb. In light of this, it is hard to comprehend why they dug such an obvious well to prevent them from reaching the burial chamber. In fact, the fact that its presence became a clear indication that they had not arrived at the burial chamber. Second, the idea of using the wells as a rainwater reservoir is eliminated because, if the well was merely intended to protect the tomb from potential rainwater, it would have been appropriate to place it at the beginning of the tomb rather than in the middle, as is often felt in this period. If the goal is to receive rainwater, then what is the need for quality and mastery, whether in in scenes or carvings or paintings? Third, following a discussion of the texts and paintings found on the well walls, which begin with King Koremhave's Wraith, Aptus deduced that the majority of these texts refer to the fifth hour of the book What is in the Netherworld, 
which talks about the god Soker and the king's transformation from earthly king to the god Osiris. Because of this, Aptus thinks that the well is only a symbolic tomb for the king who has passed away, identified as Osiris Soker. <laughs>